Good afternoon, and welcome to the last section before we actually have a break. Uh, my name is Jules Damji. I am the developer advocate for, uh, for Databricks. And since the moderator is not here, uh, I'm going to introduce myself in third person, because I'm supposed to be emceeing this particular track. Anyway, so today's talk, um, as I said, I'm going to introduce myself in third person. Jules Damji is a uh, developer evangelist with, uh, Hort, uh, with, with Databricks and also a developer advocate. He had the good fortune to working with the creators of Apache Spark, and prior to that, uh, he was working at Hortonworks and as a developer with all these different uh, companies. And he has good fortune to be an evangelist, and it's not the title that really matters. What really matters is a way of life, and I really enjoy doing it. I'm the guy on the left-hand side. Don't worry about the one on the right-hand side. I going out talking to developers and, and advocates. So why are you here today? You know, you're probably asking yourself uh, why you're here today. So today's agenda is essentially I'm going to cover the three different APIs that have sort of evolved over a period of um, you know a couple of years. A lot of developers wonder, you know, since uh, RDD was the one fundamental abstraction for for uh, Apache Spark, then came data set, data frames, then came data sets, and which one should I use, and what are the merits, and what are the pitfalls? So hopefully by the end of the uh, end of this particular talk, I'll have convince you that they are not mutually exclusive. There are scenarios where you want to use RDDs, there are scenarios where you want to use the data frames and data sets. And why structure is such an important element in Spark, because it allows us to sort of look at things in a very structured manner. We as developers and we as people in general have the innate sort of intuitive to look at things in structure. We look at data in structure, we look at tables in structure, we look at columns in structure. So it actually made a logical extension sense to actually have that view into the data structures in Spark. And then finally, if I have some time, we might have demo, and then I'll ignore all the questions that you actually have for me. Anyway, so you're not going to hear about the tale of the brokenness of the three kings of the kingdoms, but what you hear about is the APIs which really make developers really successful. How many of you actually have heard this particular book called The, uh, the Developers Are the New Kingmakers? Anybody here have read this particular book? The premise of that particular book is that today, because of the open source movement, developers are really the new kingmakers. And one of the ways, one of the keys to the realm of the kingdom of developers APIs, they have to be simple, they have to be declarative, they have to be intuitive. And that's what really makes any particular platform that you actually use today is the developer APIs. So that's actually an important book and you'll find it quite interesting. So let's look, jump into the first set of APIs which are distributed data set, which was the fundamental abstraction which entire the Apache Spark was developed. What is an RDD, really? It was this logical abstraction on which, it was on which Spark was initially um, uh, created. So what are RDDs? They actually have a certain characteristics. The first one is that they are a logical distributed abstraction over an entire cluster. So if you actually have a large data set, you can actually think of it as uh, uh, an entire data set across uh, um, your, your storage, and those could be divided into partitions. And depending on the size of the partition, some partitions might reside on a couple of uh, executors. The other partitions might reside elsewhere. So think of it as a distributed logical abstraction on which you can actually write your Lambda function, you can write your compute function, you can write your queries, and they will execute in parallel on each partition. So one, they're a distributed data abstraction, and a lot of APIs exist on that. Second, they're resilient, and they're immutable. And resilience means that I have an ability to recreate my RDD at any point in time during its execution of the cycle. And as a result, what actually happens is that when you create an RDD and you perform a certain operation, and we'll get into what operations mean, is that you go from one RDD to the next one to the third one, and they get recorded as a lineage of where I came from. So as a matter of fact, if something goes wrong, I have the ability to recreate myself. And they're immutable in the sense that when you, when you make a transformation, the original RDD remains unaltered. It's exactly the same. And hence, you actually create what we call a cyclic graph so that at any point in time, I should be able to recreate my um, RDD. So two, they're resilient and mutable. That's the second characteristic. The third one is... is 
the compile type, say, if you have RDDs of particular type, you might have an RDD of integer, you might have an RDD of, of Boolean, and as a result of that, it gives you the confidence as a developer that if you're going to write a particular complicated function and you're giving a wrong type of data, that's going to uh, give you a compile type error, and that actually saves a lot of time early in the code because your Spark application could be quite complicated, and debugging in a distributed environment can be quite cumbersome as a result. Uh, compile type safety gives you that enormous benefit. Third or fourth, data could be unstructured, or that could be a structured. And here is examples of unstructured data where you can actually have streams of articles coming from media, social media, or it could be a log file. Now, if you look at that particular log file, you might think, well, there's some sort of a semi-structure in there. You know, I have a line of log file that actually has date and it has uh, the type of operation that was being performed, and I have a URL, isn't that particular type? Well, RDD doesn't understand there are different kinds of type. It's just going to be a particular string. But it's up to you as a developer to actually go into that and, and, and parse that out. So they have both unstructured and a semi-structured attribute. And here's an example of what a structured data might look like after you've parsed that particular RDD and broken down into its respective columns that have a particular type. And then you might create a table to look at that. So fourth, fourth attribute is that they are structured or unstructured type, and they have uh, a way um, to, to, to parse them. The fifth is they're lazy. What I mean by lazy, I don't mean lazy in a human, slothful manner. They're lazy in the one that they don't get materialized till you perform a certain action uh, on, on, on the particular RDD. So over here, you can actually see that the transformation actually happening across about four different RDDs, and the T represents transformation, and A is an action. And action is where your entire chain of your acyclic graph is going to get executed. So every time you perform action, all you're doing is you're actually recreating an entire crowd. And that, as a result of that, Spark has the ability to say, well, if you're creating all this different transformation, what is it that I can do to arrange them so I can coalesce certain transformation that actually makes sense? So I can take a map and I can filter and I can put them together in one particular stage and I'll just do an action when there is some sort of reduce by key or when there is a shuffle going on. So that's how Spark internally um, materializes things in, in, in a lazy manner. That's what I mean by lazy, so they're fine. So as I said, I alluded to what are transformations and what are, what are operations. You know, Spark takes a particular acyclic graph, and if you're transforming, it goes through the lineage and creates a lineage, and when there's an action, that's what it happens. And here's an example of some of the transformation that you, that you might perform. They're very low level. You don't, I don't expect you to know all of them, but that gives you an idea, that gives you a flavor of what they are, and these are some of the actions that you can actually perform. And I, both of those together sort of gives Spark the low level API and the power to, to the developers such as, such as, such as yourselves. So you might ask, why do I actually use RDDs? Why is it, is it so important that I use it? We developers are control freaks. How many of you are control freaks here? All right. I see only two hands. That's not very nice. There you go, the third one. Wow. We got a minority of you, so sorry if I offended you. But yeah, developers like control. They want to know exactly what you're doing. And they, will, they love the idea of being flexible. So RDD gives you the, low, the control of flexibility and control of knowing, knowing exactly what's going on. They provide you a very low-level API. So, you know, it's like writing assembly language. Anybody written assembly language? I might be dating myself. Anybody? Two people, all right, brilliant, four, that's nice. All right, so it gives you that low-level API because RDDs are the lowest level at which you can actually do things. So it gives you a low-level API. Uh, they're very type safe, as I say, you know, compiled type safe is actually important if you are uh, a programmer and you want to save a lot of time, you want to, people are writing in pro, uh, compiled safe languages, they like the fact that um, the type safety is an integral part of the platform. And more importantly, they encourage you to Look at things in a manner because we like control how to do something. In other words, you're telling Spark how to do something, not what to do. And I think that's a fundamental difference I want you to take away from that, that RDD sort of gives you the control, and as a result of control, you have the ability to tell Spark exactly how to do, and it will do it. It's like garbage in, garbage out, right? So here's an example of what I mean by how to do something. There's a bunch of transformations actually happening over here. So if you look, look at this particular code, you're actually seeing that I'm reading a particular text file. And when I read the particular large, huge te uh, Wikipedia text file, this could be gigabytes or petabytes, um, then I'm, it'll split up into partitions across. And I create an RDD. And this RDD is going to be sort of distributed. And the first thing I'm doing, I'm parsing the RDD. And I'm doing a flat map, which means that I'm going to split that entire RDD into words. And then I'm using a filter to split it up into words, uh, and then 
do a case on it so that if I have four tuples in a row, which is a project and a page and the number request, and I don't care about the underscore, which is for Scala saying just match anything, and then give me a tuple of those three elements that I care about. If I don't see this particular match, toss it out, right? And then I go to the second part of the code, which is doing a filter. And once I pass it RDD, all I care about is the English Wikipedia, because the Wikipedia has pages from different languages around the world. But for the sake of demonstrations, I'm just going to pick up the English one. And what I'm doing over here, I'm parsing the filter. I'm doing a map again to say, give me the, I don't care about the first field, the page and the number of requests. And I create a tuple for so page and number requests. And then I do a reduce by key, very low level. I'm exactly telling Spark what to do. Reduce by key. And I'll reduce by key for the number of pages and the number of requests. And I add them together. And then finally, I'm creating uh, an action, right, which is take. And at this point, what's going to happen is that it will start reading the file. It will go through the first transformation, second transformation, third transformation. For all that particular piece of code, how to do something, is going to be executed in the stages. And the reduce by key will create a shuffle. Very compact code, good code. We like to think it's good code. Um, it will do what exactly you're telling it to do. So then you're asking, you know, when should you use RDDs? And I said earlier, you care about low-level APIs, you care about control of your data set, you exactly know what your data set looks like. You are dealing with unstructured data a good number of times, but you're also dealing with a lot of structured data. So if you're dealing with media streams and text, you want to use particular RDD. You want to manipulate data in a manner that uh, you don't care about high-level functions. You are, you're writing a lot of Lambda functions. As we saw in that particular piece of snippet code, we're writing a lot of Lambda functions to manipulate the data because we know exactly what the data looks like. So you don't care about that. And you don't care about a schema or structure. You know? Some of us love the fact that we come from an RD or RDMS background and we want to actually have structure. So we don't, you don't care about that, use RDDs. And then if you um, don't care about the optimization that Spark can actually provide you because of the new structure that we actually introduced in 2.0 and some of the uh, performance inefficiencies that you might, as a developer, uh, because of your uh, uh, hubris, think that you actually know exactly what you're doing, and I'm going to tell Spark what to do, and, and it will do it for you. But if you don't care about that, then that's fine. So then you're asking me, Jules, hang on, what's the problem? Right? Why, why not use RDDs? Well, the problem is that, is that because you're telling how to express something, um, not what to do, Spark cannot really optimize because I can't really peek into your Lambda functions to see whether you're doing a, a join or whether you're doing um, a select or whether you're doing um, a filter of, the, of some, some particular. I don't know what kind of data you're actually dealing with. And so as a result, that I can't really do the optimization. Um, some of the um, uh, RDDs on non-JVM languages like Python are very inefficient and take a long time. But if you don't care about that, then that's, that's one of the problems. And I think you can actually introduce unknowingly and unwillingly these inadvertent efficiencies that you think that you're actually telling Spark what to do, but you actually might, might uh, uh, introduce some problems. So what I mean by that? So let's look at an example. Here is a very innocuous looking code right? that you have actually written. And you're saying, I'm telling Spark exactly how to do something. And what you've done over here is that we're actually parsing the particular filter. And then when you're doing a case on that, and then we're doing a reduce by key, just like we did before. And then we're doing another filter. Right? We're doing another filter to remove if the page is not a particular kind. And then we're doing an action. Does anybody see a problem here? Yes. What you're doing over here is when you do a reduce by key, you're taking your entire data set across your cluster. And you're doing a massive shuffling of data across that thing. Now, Spark is not going to know that. It's just going to go in and do it for you, right? What you really want is you want to reverse those two lines. You want to filter everything out, so then you only deal with very less amount of data to, to, to reduce that. Now, because of the fact that you're not really using very high-level APIs, Spark won't know that you, that's what you're trying to do. Your intention is hidden behind the fact that you're telling it exactly what to do. And that's where the structure in Spark actually comes into play. That's where structure uh, makes a huge difference. That's where high-level APIs in which you express your computation in query to tell Spark what you're doing, and it knows and peeks into your Lambda function or peeks into your query to figure out what exactly you're doing so it can do better optimization for you. 
So understand what that means is that, let's let a quick look at uh, the RDD where things can be unstructured. We know that RDDs actually have dependencies, and we looked at those dependencies by the ability for it to actually create a lineage of the transformation so it knows exactly how to go from point A to point B because I've recorded that particular lineage in transformation. So there is, there is this notion of dependencies. There is, the, there is the idea of partition. It, it knows about some locality where your partitions are stored, so I can send the right code to the right partition to execute your Lambda functions on that. The third, that there is a compute function associated with an RDD, which, given a particular partition, is going to create an iterator, and then it will execute that particular code on that partition, distribute it across the cluster, and then merge the results back. And that's the fundamental programming model of, of an RDD. Well, what's the problem? The problem is this. This particular compute function that actually creates an operator is an opaque function. Spark doesn't know what it is, right? Spark doesn't know whether you're doing a filter. Spark doesn't know whether you're doing a, a select. Spark doesn't know whether you're trying to do a join. And, and the data that you're actually dealing with is actually quite opaque, right? I don't know whether you're actually executing or accessing a certain column. Uh, or what database uh, data frame you're actually uh, trying to access. So I, since I don't know what kind of JVM object you're dealing with, I can't really optimize it. So what I'm going to do at least is I'll, I'll just serialize this particular part of code and data, and I'll send it over to the executor and let it execute. So that's where, where um, the structured APIs come into play. And one of the things the structured APIs gives you is this particular spectrum of error detection where early in the code. So on the far left-hand side, you actually have SQL, uh, when you express a, a query in SQL in Spark 2.0, um, you will get a runtime error if you either misspell, for example, if you say select with double E, you won't get a compile time error, you'll get a runtime error, which can be quite expensive if you are doing a large ETL and then further down the code, you're executing an SQL on, on your data frames or transformation you've done, and you get a runtime error, and that can be quite expensive. If you move a little bit to the, to the right-hand side, you have the data frames, and the data frames gives you the, the compile type safety because there are all these methods associated with that, and if you select a particular method that doesn't exist or you misspell it, you'll get a compile time error. However, if you access a particular column in your particular data frame, you'll get a runtime error because it doesn't know. Uh, it's just a string as far as the, uh, the, the runtime engine is concerned. And then on the far right-hand side, you have the data sets, and data sets are, think of it, very similar type um, uh, RDDs, but they, are, they have JVM objects which are really part of your, your data set. And those could be just like a Java bin, right? You have the ability to define exactly what your, uh, uh, each and every object in your data set is going to look like, and that, that way you can actually write functions which give you compile time safety. And whether you do um, uh, get, write a function that actually takes a wrong kind of argument type, you get a get compile error. So that actually saves you that. So these three kinds of APIs were somehow converged in 2.0, and we wanted to make sure that the developers who actually deal with, with Spark 2.0 and beyond were using only one set of APIs, which are called data sets. And data frame in, in Scala, for example, is nothing but just an alias for a data set, right? Because I don't know exactly what your JVM object looks like. When I create a data frame, I'm just going to give you a data set of type row, and row is just a generic object. In Java, there's no data frame because everything is typed, so you actually get, get, get the data set. And in Python, you know, since it's, 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 it's um, uh, interpreted language, there's no notion of, of, of data sets, it's only a data frame. So what does a data frame API code look like? What is actually a data frame? A data frame is nothing, think of it as a table, right? And a table actually has a schema associated with it, and the schema actually has columns, and each column can actually have a type associated with it. So now you have your data frame that actually has columns, and each column actually has a name and a type associated with it. Now look at the, <clears throat> this particular code is no different from the RDD code. The difference over here is in the clarity and in the declarative way in which you're actually expressing your query. And over here, I'm taking my original parsed RDD, which was, which was an RDD, and I'm converting that into a data frame. And I'm saying data frame will actually have two columns, page, three columns, page, uh, project page and num request. And then I'm going to do filter by removing the project name. I'll do a group by by page, which was what we were doing with reduce by. And then I'm going to aggregate the sum of all the page numbers and then call that count, limit that by 100 so I can just have a, a, a small number of uh, display, and then I'm going to show 100 elements. Now, if you had compared that with the RDD code, you exactly had to know what column or what, where in that particular row of your 
RDD was the page number or your N. Uh, it gets a bit complicated, but this is very declarative. And because of the fact you're telling what you're doing, Spark can actually optimize that because it has a better notion of how to actually um, uh, create a catalyst, optimize a queue that can create a very efficient compact code so that this code will be a lot faster than the one you actually had to do with RDD. Here's another example. I can take actually a data frame and I can create an SQL view on top of that, and I can actually express the same query that I did with my data frame as I did with my RDD. They exactly give you the same results, but they'll be equi the, the, the data frame and the SQL will be equivalent in terms of the speed. And this is no different from the previous call. All I'm doing is, is um, doing a select, aggregate by count, and then showing uh, the 100 limit. You still don't believe me? Here's another example where I'm creating um, an RDD of, of row type, these two tuples, and I'm creating that a data frame in name and column. And then look at the code for the RDD, right? I have to know exactly what field is where. And it's fairly complicated, right? If you were to read this particular thing, it's very complicated. But you're telling exactly how to do. The same code in data frame makes a huge difference. I, I have a group by, and then I just aggregate and do a sum. So you might ask, why, why should I use structured in APIs? And I said earlier, you know, structure gives you the ability to do something quite in a very declarative manner because it's very similar to your relational operators if you come from a database background. You're telling it exactly, Spark, what to do. Uh, here's an example in SQL, which is actually doing the same thing. And here's the equivalent of what you might do if you were to um, uh, do that uh, using RDDs. So underneath, a lot of things are actually happening because when you tell Spark what to do, you get this fairly good optimization. So what's happening underneath that, he, that these are supported by the Spark SQL engine, which is built under the Catalyst Optimizer and the Tungsten uh, second code generation that actually gives you very compact code. So your query actually goes through this transformation. It has a journey. And the journey is, is very, very simple. You got... Um, any of these three expressions that we actually show, you express your query either in data set, the data frame, or, or in SQL, it actually creates an unresolved plan. And then it actually checks the catalog to see what columns or what table you're actually referring to. And that way, once it's actually done that, it creates a logical plan. And then the logical plan goes to what we call an optimized physical plan. And it creates up a number of physical plans and then costs, uh, associates costs with it and says, which is the best one for me to actually select that, and once it's actually selected that code, it does a generation of RDDs. Now, remember, these RDDs which are generated are different from the RDDs you actually, these are very optimized code. So at the end, you know, everything in Spark gets decomposed to the RDDs, right? So the RDDs are here to stay, they will never disappear at the end low-level API. This is the code that's get generated. You get very optimized code. So let's look at a quick example of what I mean by optimization. Here is a very simple query. They're actually doing two joins across, and you're doing a, a filter of, of two tables. And what the logical plan will do is create a tree of, tree of operators where I'll, I'll read the events file, I'll use the tables, I'll do a join, I'll do a filter. Then it goes to the physical aspects of in the physical pane. I'm going to rearrange that code because I'm going to read the scan users first and I'll do the scan uh, filter, and then I'll do the join. And then when the cost-based optimizer comes in, I can actually further optimize that by saying, you know, I know you're using users, I know you're scanning users from, an, from, from a relational database, and I know you're actually using the events from, say, um, a Parquet file. And I'm going to push that down to the Parquet because Parquet is more efficient to do the filtering, and I'm going to push that down to an RDMS because they're more convenient, they're more optimized to actually do the filtering. And once you do the filtering, I'll do the join. So what happens over here essentially is that you're reading less data. You're bringing up less data to Spark, and if you have less data to filter out, your query will be more efficient. It will run a little faster rather than bringing all the data up and then doing the filtering in Spark. And so when you express a query by telling Spark what you're trying to do, it will try to figure out, it will try to rearrange that code. How many of you are Java programmers? I can see JP is one right there. He's going to raise his hand, of course. <laughs> now, JIT, JIT compiler is no different, right? When you write a for loop in your, in your Java code, the JIT will rearrange your code because it exactly know how your memory layout is done. And just in time, compiler have evolved so far that they can rearrange your code. And you think you've written the best code, but no, listen, no. I can actually rearrange the code because I know exactly where my registers are. I know where the data, where the data types and what you're actually using it. So I'll create more efficient code. The same technology, the same idea, the same strategy is applied here when you actually do the just in time RDD code generated. So what's a data set? Well, data set is a sort of a more compact way of saying, 
I'm going to take my data frame, and I'm going to create a JVM object of each and every object in my data set is going to look like that particular row. So here's a very simple example. I'm reading a JSON file that might have people and might have two fields in it. And I'm going to go ahead and create a case class of type person, which will have two fields in it of type name and then integer. And I'm going to convert the data frame that into a data set. So now I have a very typed-oriented data set. And then when I use my filter, I can just use like a Java notation. I can use you know, p.age or p.name to compare against the numeric. Now, if I compare against a string, what will I get over here? I'll get a syntax error, right, compile error, because I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing. So that actually catches quite early. So what are some of the merits of using data frames and data sets in the Apache Spark 2.0? Um, this was a recent benchmark that we actually run a lot faster, as you can see. Those, the first three green lines are the ones that you use the same query. You can see they're quite equivalent. I'm using three different languages, but because they have been going through the Spark SQL engine, I get exactly the same amount of performance. You can see Python on RDD is a lot, fast, is a lot slower, and the reason is that because when you actually do a Python, we pickle that and we send it to a, 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 an external Python process that's running that's going to depickle it, that's going to execute the code, and then repickle it and send it back. And that sort of is the, is the performance hit that you'll actually get. And even RDD on Scala is a little faster, uh, but the RDD on Python is slower because there's an external process that we have to send it to communicate with you. What are some of the advantages of data sets? Well, data sets actually take less memory right, in, your, in, in the caching because the way we actually create the data sets and how the tungsten uh, code generation uses the encoders to, to, to create that off-heap memory. So in, in caching, it's, 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 it's more efficient. And when you're doing a serialization, because, you know, Java requires, I mean, uh, uh, Spark does a lot of serialization, serialization when there's a shuffles happening. And so uh, when we use encoders, which is the, the way we actually format memory using uh, tungsten code, it actually uses off-heap memory. So when we actually do the deserialization, we can just go across the memory and do it a lot faster rather than using Cryo or Java and so on and so forth. So again, back to the point, why? Why should I use data frames and data set? When should I use data sets and data frames? Um, if you care about high-level APIs and you want to express your query in the domain-specific language, you want to use uh, high-level APIs, you want to use data sets and data frames. Uh, when you care about strong type safety, when you, keep, you want to pick up the errors, you want to compile time errors early in the code, you want to use strong type safety. Um, ease of use and readability. If you want your code to read well, to read easily, to know exactly somebody is actually reading the code, uh, that they can find out exactly what you're doing rather than very cryptic way of, of doing it in RDD, uh, that's where you want to use it, or that's the reason why you want to use it. And the most important thing I think you should, uh, you should know is that when you really want to tell Spark or express in your query what is it you're trying to do, you're trying to aggregate something, you're trying to do uh, average or something, you're trying to do a filter, you're trying to do a select and so on and so forth, this is when you actually want to use uh, the, the uh, data frame data sets. And when, again, so it's no difference, it's just a corollary. You care about structure, you care about data schema, you don't have to worry about inferring, you tell it exactly what to do. And that's when you actually use structure and, and schema. When you care about code optimization, when you really want, to, want Spark to do all the optimization for you rather than you trying to tune it, um, this is the reason when you actually want to use it. And you care about space efficiency and, and, and uh, the ability to actually do things in tungsten, that's where actually you use um, your, 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 your data sets and data frames. And I think going forward, I mean, this is what the, what the future in Spark is going to be like, right? You attended the talks at the keynote, and the keynote, everything was sort of built on top of, of data frames. If you look at structure streaming, the way structure streaming actually works today is that it just uses data frames as a continuous table to do everything. Uh, if you look at ML pipelines, for example, the Spark ML, the ML pipeline is based on the notion of you actually create data frames, um, and, and that's the, the way it will forward. If you look at the new APIs that we have actually built, uh, those are based on, on data frames as well. The tensor frames that, that we presented at the meetups, those of we were here, sort of be, is built on the tap that you can actually use data frames to use, communicate with the TensorFlow in order to, to compute your um, uh, tensor gram distributed. The DL pipelines demo that you actually saw at the keynote, again, is actually based on, on, on data frames as well. 
And so, so the way future, any new things, graph friends, for example, is another example, which is really an equivalent and a replacement of, of graph, graph X, is going to be based on data frames. So any new things that we actually develop will be built on top of the, 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 the structured APIs, which is underneath or undergirded by Spark SQL engine, which has made tremendous efforts by using the Catalyst Optimizer and also by using Tungstens. And the CBO is actually going through incremental uh, performance enhancement in Spark Apache 2.2. We released what we call the cost-based optimizer that attaches statistics based on your particular query. And if your query is really um, expensive, it will, it will use the statistics to find out what's the best way to actually express that query. So visually, I mean, you know, that's what it looks like, putting it all together in conclusion. This is what the data set in RDD looks like. Data sets is the universe of everything. It has the best of the both worlds from RDDs in terms of its compiled type safe. It allows you the ability to do functional programming or a type safe manner. And it has all the great benefits of um, data frames in terms of its relational. It uses the catalyst underneath optimizer to make sure that you actually get highly performant RDD generated code. Uh, it has the ability to use, rearrange your code as you actually saw in terms of how the operators are rearranged to get you the maxim maximum benefit. And you can do the salt and filtering as you would actually do in your, in your RDD as well. I don't have time for the demo. Uh, we actually have a book coming out um, shortly called the Definitive Spark. Um, make sure you actually keep tuned. And this particular talk was really a vocalization of, of uh, the blog that I wrote, which actually was quite, went viral, called The Tale of Three APIs. And essentially, I go more into detail. And there is a, there is a notebook associated with that actually demonstrate exactly when to use RDDs, how to use RDDs. So take a look at that. And this is also a combination of one of the talks we actually gave at uh, one of the conferences. And there are some resources available over here. Um, uh, go for it. Um, These slides are going to be available to you maybe in a week or so at, at the Spark Summit, so you'll be able to do that. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I'll hang around here if you actually need questions. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I'll answer the questions, um, but I think we're out of time. We have to go out for lunch. So thank you for coming for the talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.